Shiwa Ngandu, which translates as Lake of the Royal Crocodiles. We're going to get a unique view of this historic place by going up in our balloon daisy. With us in the basket are Charlie Harvey and his son Tom. Charlie now farms all the land surrounding the lake. There we go. <laughs> Robin's a bit concerned about the wind today, so he takes off tethered to a truck. But the wind dies down and Robin casts off. Heads! Whee! All right, lap of the gods. That's a very good way of checking my stuff. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> Charlie knows every inch of this land and has charted Livingston's fateful journey. The hill behind us there, the very tall hill yeah. that we call Bareback, is where Livingston took his measurements on his last journey. He was lost and he thought that maybe the, the lake was part of the headwaters of the Nile. And on the far end of the lake, while they were crossing the lake, he lost his dog. It was him trying to rescue his dog that was, was the his downfall. Yeah, it was it? his downfall, yeah. Livingston's beloved dog, Chitane, was attacked by crocodiles on the shores of the lake. In trying to rescue his dog, Livingston lost his medical box and with it his precious supply of quinine needed to combat malaria. He fell ill soon after and died not far to the south of here. The lake looks fantastic. Mist yeah. just, just mist coming in. It's yeah. beautiful. It's a tough life we have to live here. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see now very easily the whole estate. Yeah. Yes. It's all the flat land through the hills here. If we can sort of go over there, then wouldn't it be that's lovely? A lovely big view. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you try? I try not to laugh. <laughs> no, I, after all my 38 years flying, I still you haven't mastered it. how to steer the bleeding. Thing. Didn't you read the manual? <laughs> <laughs> the tanks are getting lower and lower. We are getting lower and lower. I expect I'll carry on to the end of the forest. Okay. We've done shrubs. We've done trees. Mm -hmm. we need Grass now, don't we? That would be a first. <laughs> Robin heads for Shiwa's airstrip. It's so remote that light aircraft are the best way to travel. But it's the first time a balloon has ever landed here. Any minute now, we're going to jolt onto the ground. Just hold yourself back from the way we're travelling. Here we go. We'll stay in the basket. Skip. Oh. Welcome back to Terra Firma. Well done. Fantastic. Well done. How was that? <laughs> we do have fun here. Well, while Robin relaxes, some of us have got work to do. I've been put in charge of fending off the balloon from the vehicles. So I'm poised. After the flight, there's another treat in store. A visit to the magnificent, if rather eccentric, house that lies at the heart of the estate. Built by Charlie's grandfather, Sir Stuart Gore Brown, after the First World War, the house is one man's slightly bonkers English dream home in this far-flung corner of the Zambian bush. Charlie's wife, Jo, gives us the tour. Although it might look English, at its heart, it's very African. All the bricks were burnt on the farm, all the timber was on the farm, the doors, the frames, all the ironwork, everything was done locally. The house is held together with mud because oh. cement was too difficult to transport and actually locate. And was it Sir Stuart's design? He designed everything. From the age of 14, he was drafting little plans of how he wanted his house to be. Mm. He had over a thousand people working at one time. Oh. Crikey! And what was even more amazing is none of these people were skilled workers. You know, he actually trained them how mm. to make bricks, how to make clay tiles. All these on the roof are just clay tiles. The estate is home to a thousand cattle, two thousand head of game and nearly four hundred species of birds. 
Oh, and two very tenacious terriers. Charlie and Joe now also run Shiwa as a guest house, and the income helps support the estate and the many locals who depend on it. What's important from our point of view is that when people come to visit Shiwa and, the, and you know they pay to stay with us and stay with the house and the tourism, that that money trickles right the way through because you're benefiting 11,000 people, and that you know is my grandfather's dream and is ours sort of continuation. But it's actually working now. Charlie lets me ride his favourite cow, Kate Moss. His work is so central to local life that he is known affectionately as the white man with the black heart. We're leaving Zambia and heading into neighbouring Botswana, but there's trouble ahead. Our destination is the Okavango Delta. In a dry, arid country, this inland delta is Africa's largest and most beautiful oasis. We're waiting to cross the Zambezi River into Botswana when bad news reaches us. We hear there may be a problem ahead with the Botswanan authorities. Our balloon flight over the Okavango is under threat. Despite months of negotiations, it looks like we may be beaten by red tape. Hello, dearest gentle folk, and welcome to Botswana, where we have come across something of a cropper. Um, having been given permission to fly with Captain My Captain and Daisy throughout the skies of Tanzania, Rwanda, Zambia and later on Namibia. Unfortunately, the powers that be in Botswana, they say... They say no. They say no. Yeah. They're a bit worried that uh, the burners, the sound of the burners on the balloon, might spook the animals. Um, we haven't had that problem anywhere else. But uh, we have to abide by their rules, otherwise... Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, uh, they were threatening, I think, to charge us a lot of money, impound the whole balloon. Oh! And I think I'd get into an awful lot of trouble. Well, we can't have that. No. I remembered the old adage, don't let the bureaucrats grind you down. So though we can't fly the balloon, I'm still determined to see the Delta from the air, and I hastily arrange a helicopter flight. These apparently are allowed. The Okavango Delta is home to thousands of wild animals. At full flood, it's almost the size of Wales. The waters feeding it travel over 800 miles from the mountains in neighbouring Angola. The floods begin in the north of the delta in midsummer and arrive in the southern reaches six months later. The Okavango supports one of the highest concentrations of large mammals in the world, including lions, elephants, hippos, zebra and rhino. Many animals have had to adapt to life in the region, including lions, which have to swim when their territories become inaccessible islands during the floods. But for my first animal encounter here, I need to get back onto the ground, because I'm off in search of one of the Okavango's most elusive and successful predators, the leopard. Getting the real lowdown on this magnificent creature has never been easy. They're the hardest of the big cats to find and to film. A lot of this information that we get from these callers goes well beyond just finding the animal. Andrew Steen, a young American researcher who's been studying them for seven years, is going to show me how the use of satellite collars has revolutionized looking at leopards. At first light, Andrew uses the aerial at base camp to get a fix on where the leopards might be. Then we're off. So who are we hoping to see today? The animal that we're going to go and track is 
named Goose. All the leopards, for the most part, are named after famous aviators. Mm -hmm. One of the earlier male leopards was named Maverick after the right. pilot on Top Gun, yeah. Tom Cruise character. And one day he was tracked, and we found him, but he was actually up in a, up in a tree dead, being eaten by another leopard. It's extremely uncommon to see that. So Andrew took the collar off the dead Maverick and put it on this new leopard who they christened Goose to stick with the Top Gun theme. Hopefully we'll see him. He's a very impressive cat. He's quite relaxed around vehicles, so we find him we should have a pretty good sighting. Little is known about leopards because they're so reclusive and always on the move through the bush. But here in Santawani, a unique study is looking at how leopards live with other top predators such as lions, cheetahs and hyenas. Okay. Andrew uses a handheld aerial to get a fix on Goose. Yeah, it looks like we're picking up Goose just down the road this side. So we'll go have a look for him and uh -huh. then we'll go from there to see who else is around. All right. Now, since tracking him, we've seen him with three different females. Right. So he seems to be doing he's, okay he's onto a good thing. Yeah. Andrew's team receive a reading, alerting us that Goose is nearby. They've sighted him. Yeah. You see, he's a kilometer down the middle cut line, just off the road. So we've just had information that Goose was spotted in the shade of the acacia tree and that was about 20 minutes ago it might just be lying in the shade so we go have a look oh i think we should as we're here okay <laughs> Even though the tracking device tells us he's only a few feet away, we just can't spot him. But then... There he is. Drove right past him. This camouflage is just perfect. You can see how they can be such efficient hunters in this type of environment. He's a big fella. Let's, uh, I might move this to the side, just to be this close to a leopard in the wild. He's looking right at us. With a predator as dangerous as the leopard, we're going to have to stay in the vehicle. He seems fairly content to tolerate us being so close. And he's just lying right down in the shade now. And he's catching flies as well. Leopards have been described as the ultimate predator. They can carry up to three times their weight and have been known to kill small giraffes and drag their carcasses six meters up into the trees. They're the ultimate ambush predator. Mm -hmm. They can get within just a couple meters of their prey using the camouflage, using the environment, stalking from different angles and taking into account wind direction, alertness, of their potential prey and cover to be able to get very close and make that final pounce. 